Welcome to the USMLE Step 2 Success Podcast. I'm Dr. Rajani Kata, author of Success on the Wards, and in this podcast, I share clinical cases with targeted teaching points. This podcast is not affiliated in any way with the National Board of Medical Examiners, and cases and teaching points are not meant to serve as an official study guide or medical guidance. I've been a faculty member for over two decades, and during that time, I've advised hundreds of residency applicants. I know how important standardized test scores are, but I always emphasize to my students that they're just one piece of the puzzle. It's very important to learn how to succeed and do well during your time on clinical rotations, not only because of grades, not only because of your educational experience, but also because that forms the foundation for your letters of recommendation and for the comments that go into your dean's letter. If you'd like to learn more about how to succeed in the residency match, you can sign up for a free 100-page excerpt of my book on our website, thesuccessfulmatch.com. It's a Saturday afternoon and you're surprised to get a phone call from a friend that you haven't spoken to in at least two months. As you take the phone call, she tells you that she's reaching out for some medical advice. And you ask her what the problem is, and she says that for the last four weeks or more, she really hasn't felt like herself. She's having a hard time concentrating at work. She works for a big corporation, and she tells you that she's just really feeling fatigued, and she's also having problems with her sleep. She finds herself sleeping more, and she's even gained weight. You ask her if she's feeling depressed or if her mood is lowered, And what she tells you is that no, it's not so much that she feels depressed, it's just that she doesn't take pleasure in doing the activities that she used to do, like going out with her friends or um, or any of her hobbies. So you ask her a few more questions and it turns out that she has seen her physician. And the physician ran a number of blood tests and he told her that they were all normal, including her thyroid tests, her vitamin D and B12 levels, her CBC, her comp metabolic. And he had asked her more questions, including things like if she had ever had manic episodes. And she denied any of those as well. The doctor had told her that he wanted to prescribe a medication. And she wants to get your thoughts about what you think about this medication. As you're listening to this history, what do you believe to be the most likely diagnosis? What do you think would be the best initial treatment here? Would it be a benzodiazepine? Or would it be paroxetine? Or would it be trazodone? Well, as you were listening to the history, one of the key features of this is that she gave multiple symptoms that went along with a history of major depressive disorder. And this is a condition that, well, this case, all of the identifying details have been changed, but this is a case that's really close to my heart because major depression is very common. And it is something that your friends or your colleagues or your family members that one of them or more of them are likely to experience in their lifetime. And that's because major depression, well, it's the most common psychiatric disorder in the world. But beyond that, it is very prevalent. In the United States, about one in six individuals will experience a bout of major depression in their lifetime. And what that means is if you think about your medical school class of 180 people, if one out of six of those individuals is going to experience about a major depression in their lifetime, it is something that you would expect your colleagues to be experiencing. So it's something where it's really important to be able to recognize it in yourself, in your colleagues, in your friends. In order to make the diagnosis of major depressive disorder, there's a list of symptoms, and you would have to experience five or more of these symptoms for most of the day 
nearly every day for greater than two weeks in a row. And at least one of those symptoms must be either depressed mood or a loss of interest or pleasure in usual activities. And I think it's very interesting and surprising, um, you know, if you don't know a lot about major depression, that in almost half of cases, people who are experiencing major depression actually deny depressed feelings. Instead, they may have a decrease in activity and social withdrawal. So they might be brought in by family members noticing um, this social withdrawal or anhedonia or decreased activity. There are also a number of people who instead of a depressed mood, develop irritability. And certainly we know that a lot of people self-medicate. So what looks like perhaps alcohol abuse may actually be related to major depression. So one of the key features is they, might, they must have either a depressed mood or anhedonia, that loss of pleasure. Other important symptoms are a change in appetite or weight, either increase or decrease. A change in sleep patterns, either increase or decrease psychomotor agitation or relaxation. Another one would be fatigue. Another one would be feelings of worthlessness or excessive guilt. Another symptom would be poor concentration. And finally, recurrent thoughts of death or suicide. So when you go back to our patient, she was reporting changes in multiple of these symptoms. So she didn't report the depressed mood, but she did report anhedonia and certainly had the fatigue and the poor concentration, the change in sleep patterns, the change in weight. So the most likely diagnosis here would be major depressive disorder. One of the things that her physician had specifically asked her about were a history of either manic or hypomanic episodes. And that's really important because as you're choosing your treatment, you want to make sure that you're not seeing somebody who's experiencing major depression as a facet of bipolar disorder because your treatment is going to be different. So that's why it's really important to rule out manic or hypomanic episodes. It's also important to look for organic causes of depression. So her physician had already checked so it appears that the physician has already ruled out other causes and it appears that we are dealing with major depression. So now we need to talk about the best initial therapy for major depression. It has been shown that both antidepressant medications as well as psychotherapy have been effective in the treatment of depression. Studies suggest that combination treatment is more effective but either treatment can be given alone. So in this case, it is appropriate to prescribe an antidepressant. So if you look at the options, the option of a anxiolytic, like a benzodiazepine, that is used for anxiety, not depression. So that's not ideal. Paroxetine is a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor and that would be a good initial treatment. We're gonna come back to that one. The other option, trazodone increases drowsiness, so it's not a great option in somebody who's already experiencing increased sleep. So let's talk a little bit about antidepressant choices. And this is one where it probably would be helpful to go ahead and make out a list and start to learn the different antidepressant classes. And when you think about prescribing antidepressants, you would approach it sort of similarly in the way that you might approach a, um, a list of antibiotics. You have to learn a lot of the specifics about when you would choose a particular option. When we're looking at antidepressants, there are older antidepressants. One group of that is tricyclic antidepressants, and another group are monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Those are two of the first generation antidepressants, and they are effective, and they are still used in some cases of resistant depression. However, they do have a lot of potential for side effects and interactions, so they're no longer used as first-line treatment. Instead, first-line treatment is with second-generation 
of antidepressants. And the second generation of antidepressants includes four major groups and they are considered to be roughly equivalent in efficacy. And so as a physician, when you're choosing an option, you really narrow in on the side effect profile of the medication, any comorbidities that the patient has, what other medications that they're on, perhaps the patient preference, um, even things like prior response to antidepressants or insurance coverage. So there are a lot of practical considerations when you're in practice. So this group of second generation antidepressants are roughly equivalent in efficacy. There are four main groups of these second generation antidepressants. And when you think about the pathogenesis of depressions, it is believed to be a complex interplay of factors related to genetics and individual profile and environmental factors and family history. So there's a complex interplay of factors. And when you look at the neurotransmitters in the brain, what you are able to demonstrate is that there is a change in levels of neurotransmitters. We really narrow in on three main neurotransmitters. The first is serotonin also known as the feel-good chemical, which is a gross oversimplification, but is an easier way to remember it. The second is norepinephrine, which is both a neurotransmitter and a hormone. The third is dopamine, which relates to feelings associated with reward or reinforcement. And decreased levels of dopamine may contribute to depression as well. So, three main neurotransmitters, serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. There are others that may play a role as well, but these are kind of the three that we're going to focus in on. And one of the main groups of second generation antidepressants are known as selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So when you inhibit the reuptake of serotonin, what you're left with is more serotonin that ends up in your synapses. So SSRIs are typically the first choice for many cases of major depression. So you need to memorize several of these options. Fluoxetine is kind of the granddaddy of them all. That's Prozac. I think if you memorize at least five here, fluoxetine, sertraline, paroxetine, as well as citalopram and escitalopram. So go ahead and memorize these five because these would be great first initial treatment. The second category of these second generation antidepressants are serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. So these help your levels of both serotonin and norepinephrine. A third category is called atypical antidepressants, bupropion and mirtazapine, and then a final category is known as serotonin modulators, and one of those would be trazodone. On the face of it, these are a lot of medications to memorize. I think it is helpful to go ahead and make a flashcard here with some of the major medications in each of these categories. But on the boards, I think what they're going to ask you is sort of a few main patient profiles. So I think you have to memorize a few of these. And the first one to memorize would be the SSRIs. I think you need to go ahead and memorize at least these five because this is gonna be a great first initial treatment for your patient with major depressive disorder. And then you have to memorize a few specific situations. And these situations are the ones where patients have specific symptoms and then there is a particular antidepressant that would be ideal for that situation. So for example, if you had your patients, their twin sisters, Dula and Venla, and they're in their 40s, and along with their depression, they're experiencing chronic pain and fatigue. Well, in that case, Dula and Venla could be treated with duloxetine and venlafaxine. And this is one where there was a really popular TV commercial 
well, I saw it a lot on TV, and it was about a woman who was in her 40s, and she was experiencing a lot of musculoskeletal pain along with her depression. And the tagline was that depression hurts. So there is a subcategory of patients with major depression who have a lot of musculoskeletal symptoms and fatigue as part of their depression. So in these patients, in Dula and Venla, your ideal treatment would be duloxetine and venlafaxine. These are both serotonin norep norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, and this group is ideal for those patients. Your second patient that I want you to think about is Myrta. Myrta is a 30-year-old woman, and with her depression, she's experiencing a lot of insomnia. She's also experienced weight loss, so she's very thin, and she doesn't care if she gains weight. So the ideal one for Myrta would be a medication called Mirtazapine. Mirtazapine is in a category called atypical antidepressants. And the side effect profile of Mirtazapine is that it increases drowsiness and it increases your risk of weight gain. So it would be ideal for somebody like Myrta who's experiencing insomnia and who's already experienced weight loss, so she's not concerned about weight gain. The third patient that I want you to remember is Bup. Bup is a 20-year-old young man. He's a smoker, and when you suggest an antidepressant to him, he's not really on board with that because one of the things he's really worried about is a decrease in sexual function. He's heard that antidepressants can affect your libido and he doesn't want any part of that. Bup would then be an ideal candidate for bupropion. Bupropion is a medication that's in a category of atypical antidepressants and bupropion helps with smoking cessation. And it's also ideal in this case because it has less risk of sexual function effects as a potential side effect. So bupropion would be ideal for bup. There's one other situation that you need to memorize, and that is the use of citalopram. Citalopram is one of the SSRIs but it carries an important risk of QT interval prolongation. So if you had a patient who already had that or had risk factors for that, you would want to avoid citalopram. So those are some of the considerations around your antidepressants. The next question that you might be asked would be, you've started your patient on paroxetine. She hasn't responded to treatment. Now you've used the minimum therapeutic dose for four weeks, and after four weeks, she just hasn't responded to treatment. What is going to be your next step? Would it be increasing the dose of your medication? Would it be electroconvulsive therapy? Or would it be transcranial magnetic stimulation? Well, in this case, the next step is to increase the dose. And that's because you started at the minimum therapeutic dose. So now you want to go up on your dose, still keeping it within that therapeutic dose range. Now, one of the important things to always tell your patients with major depression is that it typically takes six to 12 weeks for full effects which can be really alarming to a patient who's feeling very down and who's experiencing all these symptoms because that means it can take up to three months before that medication really reaches its full effects. However, what you can tell your patient is that you should see some response by four weeks. And let me tell you that if you're not seeing any response by the end of four weeks, we're going to go ahead and increase your dose. But I wanna start with the minimum dose possible just to try to limit those potential side effects. And I also wanna tell you that a lot of patients start to see an improvement within the first one to two weeks. So you might have a quick improvement, but I really want you to check in with me at four weeks because if you're not experiencing any improvement at all, we're gonna go ahead and increase that dose. 
Now the next board question that is going to be an important one is what if you have gone up to the maximum therapeutic dose range of two different antidepressants that you have instituted psychotherapy as well and collaborative and supportive care. So you're using effective treatments in depression and your patient is still not experiencing improvement. Well, that is a scenario that happens. So treatment-resistant depression, is it's very worrisome. So then your considerations are going to be either electroconvulsive therapy or transcranial magnetic stimulation, TMS or ECT. Both of those would be good choices for patients who are unresponsive to effective treatments for depression. In your friend's case, this is very worrisome. Her symptoms do suggest a diagnosis of major depressive disorder, and it is really important that she consider treatment. She's already seen her primary care physician who's asked her about manic episodes and who's looked for organic causes of her depression, who's ruled that out. And so with her anhedonia that's been present for over two weeks, with her loss of concentration, her fatigue, her changes in sleep pattern and weight, it's really important that she get treated. If the physician had recommended treatment with an SSRI, a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, such as paroxetine or sertraline or fluoxetine, or citalopram or escitalopram, any of those would be great choices for your friend. You don't want a medication that's going to increase the risk of drowsiness because that's already an issue for her. So you're going to stay away from medications like trazodone or mirtazapine. Now, in terms of other specific situations, if it was a patient with chronic pain and fatigue, as part of her depression, then you would think about Dula and Venla. That's duloxetine and venlafaxine, which are serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. If instead you were dealing with a patient who was dealing with insomnia and weight loss, then you might consider Mirta or Mirtazapine. If on the other hand you were dealing with a patient who was a smoker and very concerned about a side effect of sexual functioning, then you would think about bup, bupropion. If your patient did not respond to treatment within four weeks, your next step would be increasing the dose, still staying within that therapeutic dose range. But that would be your next step. You would start with the minimum therapeutic dose, and then at four weeks, you would increase that dose. But you would reassure your patient that although it takes up to 12 weeks sometimes to see full effects, they should see some improvement within four weeks. And if they don't, you're going to change the dose. But a lot of patients do notice some improvement within just one to two weeks. Finally, if your patient is unresponsive to good therapy, the ideal therapy being a combination of antidepressants and psychotherapy along with supportive care, if you've done all that and they haven't responded to good treatment regimens, then you need to think about electroconvulsive therapy or transcranial magnetic stimulation. So one of the most important parts of this case is just recognizing major depressive disorder taking it seriously, and really encouraging your patient to seek treatment. And it's not just your patient. It could be your friend or your family member or your colleague because major depressive disorder is very common. And in the United States, about one in six will experience a bout in their lifetime. So the most important thing you can do for your friend here is really encourage her to seek treatment.